I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are Navigating the Journey. Navigating the Journey is dedicated to the choices that we have in life and to respect those choices. And our lives take all kinds of twists and turns, and for those of you that have been with us, you, you know how many different paths we've been. But today, is it's it's a new path for us and yet it's an old path one that we've all all some of us have been down and that is today we have this lovely lovely young lady who is a cancer survivor Amen. breast cancer and well now we're going to let her tell the story i'm not going to tell you the story but it's heartbreaking I want you to know that. And so, Asia? Hi, I'm Asia Alvario, and I'm a cancer survivor now four years. Praise Jesus. And um, when I got diagnosed in 2015, I didn't think much of it. I just thought it was a cyst because I was told breast cancer doesn't hurt. So in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to go check on it. It took me a while. My husband had to force me. And I finally went, did my mammal, and then I was told, oh, we have to take a biopsy. So I got a biopsy done, and they said, oh, we'll get back to you in a week. Well, <laughs> I didn't get my results in a week. It was like the next day my doctor called me and gave me my results. And I was just thrown back. And then I was like, you know, I sat there and asked why, and then cried a little bit. and then. I just picked myself up and said, you know what, this is not going to beat me, you know, I'm, I got, I'm going to fight this, you know, and with the grace of God, I, I beat it, I'm still, you know, cancer free, thank God, for four years, and um, it's just been, it's just been a, a journey, a, a, a really rough journey now, you know, plateauing, but within that, you know, I've suffered a lot of nerve damage having to endure chemo. And I thought when I first had my experience of my hands being numb, I thought That's from the chemo? Yeah, from the chemo. I didn't know that. And then when I found out from my doctor, okay, that is some symptoms. And then after the numbness went away, then I was getting sharp shooting pains in my fingers and in my toes. And I was like, wow, is this gonna be forever? And from what I got from my doctor was it may go away, it may not go away. Wow. And this is four years on, I'm still suffering with that, you know, sharp shooting pain. And so I was homeopathic before cancer. So I did chemo to beat the cancer, and I did tell my doctor that I'm gonna fight to keep cancer away homeopathically, because that's what I choose. So when I found out and had more research about CBD and marijuana and how it can be a, it can kill cancer and how it can be a cancer prevention. I was like, that's great because the side effects, there is none. It's a plant. Yes, a female yes, plant. Yes, it's a plant and it's not something man-made, which yeah. I really like, you know. So I was like, you know, this is my, this is what I'm going to do. I also do some other things too, like um, vitamin, vitamin D drip. Um, you know, I take some supplements and I do other um, homeopathic IP treatments to keep it away. Keep, but, yeah. yeah. So now, and you have a baby. Yes, I do. She's my miracle baby. <laughs> miracle baby? Yes. I, we was trying for years prior to cancer. And when I got diagnosed, I wanted to freeze my eggs so I could have potentially have a baby after. But I couldn't. 
And that was heartbreaking because it, my cancer was uh, dependent on my estrogen. Right. So I would have to take all these hormones that at that time would not be good for my cancer. So I just let it, left it in the good Lord's hand and lo and behold, he, he surprised me <laughs> and my I, doctors. Yeah, oh, she's a darling little yeah, girl. Yeah, she's 22 months as yeah. of yesterday. So now tell us what happened with, with you and why you're here. Well, okay. So when what happened was I had got searched through TSA. Um, prior to going to the airport, I was informed by, by caregivers and people that have the license that, hey, if you take three grams, you'll be okay. You're not breaking, you're not breaking the law. So I was like, okay, is that good with my license? It's like, yeah. So I was like, okay. So I didn't think much of it. I was like, I got my license. I'm, I met, I waited. It was three grams. Okay, we're good. I put it in my, in my carry-on, which is my baby's bag. And we went through, everything was fine. But I guess it really smelled, the flower. I, um, well, the medicine really smelled. So they ended up checking my bag. So I, I, they found it, and I was like, oh, I have my card, my medical license for that. I gave them that and gave them my this doctor's the, name, this the TSA. TSA yeah, people. they yeah. made it so hard for me. They, they made me feel so embarrassed. Um, I, I felt judged. I mean, they made me feel like I was a criminal. Like, really? I am showing you my license that I pay for, that I pay the state for, and this is three grams, and you're treating me like if I had like a whole load that I'm bringing in, which is not the case. And I was just gonna go to go work. And I was like missing, almost missing my flight. And I had to then wait for the sheriff, which took some time. And the sheriff was really nice. Um, he's the one that told the TSA because my baby was crying and they wouldn't let me get the bottle out of her bag. And so the, TSA, um, the sheriff then said, hey, she's not breaking any laws right now. She has a right to go get the bottle for her baby. Let her go get the baby's bottle. So finally he did that. But he did tell me that um, he has to confiscate it. I said, why? I have my license. And he says, because the state law and the federal law is different. And your license is for state. I said, yeah, but it's three grams. I said, what am I going to do? There is no dispensary at the time on Big Island. There was none. I said, so what am I going to do? And he says, I'm sorry. And he says, but if you don't give me or surrender the um, marijuana, then when you arrive in Kona, we're going to have you arrested and CPS will be involved. Take the bait. Yes. Oh, my God. So when I heard that, I was like, you know, this is not worth it. I'll suffer. It's fine. I gave them, I signed the paperwork saying that I was, um, I acknowledged that they, I surrendered my medicine, that they have my ID, that um, I gave them my marijuana license, and I had to sign off on the papers before I could leave. And it was just, it was just, <laughs> it was just nonsense to me. You know what I mean? It's not like I went there through TSA without any medical license. I have my license. I pay for it. So how is it helping me? I, that's the thing I do not understand, and that is the state will issue your card yes. to everybody in the state that's mm -hmm. qualified. If your doctor says, to, for your pain, mm -hmm. this is what you need, and there's only eight dispensaries in the whole state. Exactly. And if you, let's say you lived on Molokai, mm -hmm. there are no dispensaries. Mm -hmm. And you buy your uh, cannabis mm -hmm. and, at a dispensary on Maui. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got to go home. Mm -hmm. So now you've got to fly because that's the only way to do mm -hmm. it. And if you're taking it during the day and you live on Molokai, you come to Maui to work, then you go home and back and forth, back and forth mm -hmm. every day. And now they say you can't do that. Mm -hmm. That is just outright discriminatory. I think it's outright ironic because don't we all pay for medical insurance? 
And that with that medical insurance that we pay for, it lets us buy prescription medication, right? Which that pr prescription medicine we can take on the plane. You can take, now you can take oxycodone. Yeah. And take it on the plane. On the plane. A man-made substance. Yes. But me, because of my choice of to heal my pains that I suffer every day, I have, because I'm not conforming to Western medicine and I'm doing homeopathic, my choice, I'm getting scrutinized. And I feel that's discriminating. It is. I feel. It and is. And I, I don't want anything like this to ever happen to anybody else. But it's an undue burden, mm -hmm. really, on, on patients, on anybody. Like I said, if you work, now you, you have a business on the mm -hmm. Big Island. Yeah, and here. And here. Mm -hmm. So you have to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. What kind of business do you have? I have a construction company, Alvario Inc. Wow. Yeah. You don't look like <laughs> <laughs> No. I'm I'm the back end. I hold the I hold all the you know <clears throat> the responsibilities and the insurance and all that stuff. My husband is the contractor. Uh -huh. Yeah, and he's the one that goes on the job and gets the job. So I'm the back end. I'm, I call myself admin. Oh. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm your host Lillian Kumik from Lillian's Vegan World. I'm, I come to you live every second Friday from 3 p.m. And this is the show where I talk about the plant-based lifestyle and veganism. So we go through recipes, some upcoming events, uh, information about health, regarding your health, and uh, just some ideas on how you can have a better lifestyle, eat healthier, and have fun at the same time. So do join me. I look forward to seeing you. and. Uh, Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Melly James, host of Let's Mana Up. Tuesdays, every other Tuesday, from 11 to 11.30. This show is meant to dive into stories of local product entrepreneurs and how they're growing their companies from right here in Hawaii. I'm so thrilled to have our show kicked off, and so please join us on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock as we talk to local entrepreneurs and hear their stories. Joining us now is Dr. Clifton Otto. And he is a dear, dear friend. And he has been with us since we started Cannabis Chronicles, what, a couple of years ago. And Dr. Otto has been working tirelessly to get medical cannabis off the Schedule 1 uh, list and uh, then to do all kinds of, get the state to recognize that 20 years ago, the state said we could have medical cannabis and now in the last week, the Attorney General seems to not understand. Mm -hmm. Or am I missing something here, Cliff? Um, so you're talking a little bit about what's going on with this inter-island transportation bill? Yes, now? yes. Yes, yeah, so uh, as you know, the governor uh, decided to go ahead with the veto of HB 290 uh, yesterday, unfortunately. And, and we did our best to try and influence his decision and the that bill itself was basically designed to clarify the right of patients to travel to other islands with their cannabis for personal medical use um, right now the law actually uh, allows dispensaries to transport to other islands uh, samples for lab testing purposes and um, actually prohibits patients from transporting to other islands if they are transferring to other patients. And there were some problems with the way that our local law enforcement is handling our patients at the airport, and that's why uh, this bill HB 290 was necessary. Well, it seems strange, um, and, and we've talked about this just a while ago, that if you um, are working on one island, and you live on another island, uh, and there's no dispensaries on that island, then how are you to do, and it is legal, you've got a card from the state, how are you to transport what you buy and take it home? 
Well, exactly. That's that's the issue right there. And, and we're in a unique situation being an island state where patients can live on one island and commute daily to another island in order to make their livelihood. So you may have seen in, in the governor's communication back to the legislature on why he vetoed HB 290 that, that part of his explanation was that the islands only extend out three nautical miles. And so that in that intervening space is under federal regulation, which which is OK. I mean, we, we might be able to accept that because there is a federal aviation regulation that would specifically allow uh, cannabis to be carried aboard aircraft if it's authorized by state law. Well, that same uh, law that you're talking about also says that you can't transport alcohol, uh, uh, oxycodone, which is a Schedule II, and, um, and marijuana. It's all in the same law. So how can they reach in and say, well, you can't take that one, but you can take oxycodone, you can take whiskey and wine. No. Well, that, that's a very good question. And we believe it's because of guidance coming from the office of our attorney general, which is advising the governor that federal law is being violated. Uh, and so nothing can be done until there's a change at the federal level, which unfortunately overlooks uh, the Tenth Amendment and the right of patients to accept the medical use of controlled substance. And it also applies the supremacy clause when there is no conflict between state and federal law. So uh, unfortunately, the U.S. Constitution is not being applied properly and also our, our state law is not being honored. Well, yes, and it's, and now I'm a layperson. But my reading of the Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution says that the state has to give the feds the right, that the, the rights of the state are first, and then the state has to give the feds the right. So in this case, the state of Hawaii decided 20 years ago that we could have medical marijuana. And that, exactly. So, so I, I don't know whether the Attorney General has no idea about this or what, but reading all of their uh, rationale, it seemed to me that the Attorney General did not read all of the resolutions, bills, and whatnot that have gone into making this industry what it is. I hate well, to say it, that yes, she's a newbie. It, 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 it is a bit of a perplexing situation because you would think that our state attorney general would be standing up for state law and recognizing the impact that this medical use has upon the Federal Controlled Substances Act. And as you said, 20 years ago, our state lawfully accepted the medical use of a Schedule One controlled substance. And what our state did not do was go back to the Department of Justice and tell them that the accepted medical use of cannabis in Hawaii exists, and therefore uh, our medical use of cannabis program does not violate federal law because federal law says if the substance has accepted medical use, it cannot be in federal Schedule One. Well, and then why is it? Well, I guess. I, you can't answer that question. I was going to say, why, why is it that the Attorney General doesn't seem to know that? However, when you look at the schisms between some of these departments in the state of Hawaii, the governor of Hawaii is the most powerful governor in the United States. He has 18 departments and commissions in his office, and yet we have one department that doesn't know what the other department's doing. And he obviously doesn't know what any of them are doing. You know, if the attorney general doesn't know what the health department is doing and the agriculture department mm -hmm. doesn't know what the, oh, it, it's, it's unbelievable. Well, well you know, Marsha, I, I suspect at some point a decision was made that 
Nothing is going to be done about this issue until there's a change at the federal level, and that, that has been spread to all the agencies that are involved. And so nobody is really able to step back and reevaluate the issue and the state medical use argument and make a change in course based on supporting federalism instead of federal supremacy. What is federal supremacy? Well, so federal supremacy is based on the supremacy clause within the U.S. Constitution, which says that when there is a conflict between state and federal law, federal law uh, preempts state law. And in this case, where actually the Federal Controlled Substances Act has been designed by Congress to allow changes in state medical use to impact the Federal Controlled Substances Act, um, this is an instance where there is no conflict in federal law, where actually the federal law is designed so that if there is a change in the state medical use of controlled substance, this can, this can be reflected in a, in a change in how that substance is regulated at the federal level so that there can be harmony between the state and federal regulation of this controlled substance that now has medical use. Congress never intended that states would be at odds with the federal government in terms of how controlled substances are regulated. Well, uh, but, okay. Now, in, what was it, uh, Gonzales, uh, 2006, yep. the, the state Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, said that the states have a right to regulate their own medical uh, issues. And how is it that, that they've overlooked this? I mean, the fact, well, 2006, yes, and we have the state of Hawaii has made this legal. They issue the cards, and yet, for some reason, the AG's office doesn't seem to understand what's going on. Yes, it's, it's a very unfortunate uh, situation, especially, like you said, we've got this Supreme Court precedent that looked at this in a slightly different way. It involved a Schedule II controlled substance that was, the state had decided had medical use in uh, the aid in dying. And uh, the Attorney General, the U.S. Attorney General, uh, sued the state and tried to shut down the use of that controlled substance for that particular purpose. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court uh, ruled in favor of Oregon, uh, confirming what we know from federalism, that this is that the, the authority to decide the medical use of a controlled substance has been reserved to the states. It was never transferred to the federal government. And so that gives the state the authority to decide how controlled substances will be used in that state and that because of the construction of the Federal Controlled Substances Act, that directly impacts the federal regulation of that controlled substance within that state. Well, now, but we're only talking medical cannabis. We're not talking adult cannabis or recreational cannabis, whatever the in phrase is. We're only yeah. talking medical. We're only talking about the fact that this beautiful young lady has been certified by you, her doctor, that she is eligible to take cannabis for her enduring pain. Now, she didn't, we're not asking the state for anything else. That's all. Mm -hmm. exactly. And it seems totally, uh, according to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, this is an undue burden in, in the Title VII, I think it is, about uh, public accommodations. This is an undue burden. So, you know, of course, my thought is, how do we sue? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what else we can do. What, where, where do we? Go, where can we go from here? Yeah, that's that's a very good question, and um, maybe it takes something like that to clarify this. Maybe maybe we need a judiciary review 
to clarify the, once again, this authority of states to decide how controlled substances are used within the state, which directly impacts upon uh, federal law. Yes. Well, you know, Cliff, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you for introducing us to this beautiful young lady that has a construction company on one island and lives on another, and now she's caught in the middle with her yes. need for cannabis to alleviate alleviate the pain and suffering that she's going through. So thank you again for being with us. And yes, we will have to find how to do a judicial review. Thank you, sweetheart, thank so much. You. It's been a pleasure meeting you. And thank you, and we'll see you next time. Aloha. <laughs>